Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Conversations with Nicole. My guest today, Dr. Craig Cohen of Inlet Physical Medicine out of Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. He's an expert in bioidentical hormone therapy, regenerative medicine, and chiropractic rehabilitation, and a whole lot more. Dr. Cohen, I'm really excited to have you as my guest today. Oh, Nikki, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We have a lot to talk about today in order uh, looking at enhancing our health and, as you say, full vitality in life. And one of the things that's really important as we are in the midst of a pandemic dealing with COVID-19 is immunity. That's something that you really want to talk about today. Yeah, I, I do. And it's an important conversation, I guess, more so than ever before. And one of the things I think to focus on is really where we're at it is, as a society, not only with this COVID, but just in general. And I thought I'd throw some statistics at you, just to sort of, some of them are very sobering. But over the past 25 years or so, breast cancer has risen 256% since just 1980. Since 1960, global fertility has been cut in half. The estimated couples with fertility problems is now 20%. Obesity continues to rise. Testosterone is dropping over 100 nanograms per deciliter every 10 years. So men are seeing their testosterone levels plummet. Depression rates, antidepressant prescriptions continue to rise. Um, in 1975, one out of 5,000 children were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, and currently it is one in 36. Yeah. Um, you know, so those are just a little sampling of kind of the things we're dealing with. And, you know, when you really look at the causation of all this, you, you got to look at our environment and how our environment is affecting us. Um, and I look primarily at toxicity. And I, I think it's, it, there's a lot of misconceptions about viruses. I used to think for a long time that we were a sterile environment. And what would happen is we would be exposed to a virus and we would get sick and, you know, the virus would run its course and it would get better. Or I was a sterile environment and I would be exposed to a bacteria or a fungi. We would go to the doctor, we would get on medication and we would get better after the medication did the trick. But really, Viruses are unavoidable. They've been here long before we were here. Every breath of air you breathe has 10 to the 31 viruses. And our minds can't conceptualize what that means with zeros. But that's 10 million times the number of stars in the sky is the amount of viruses that are in the air. Well, then you have the same amount in the water and you have the same amount in the soil. So viruses are very important to our you know, biogenome, our, our makeup of our immunity system. So these things we're seeing right now, especially with COVID, is an alteration in how we are dealing with those viruses. And I think really that boils back to our bodies not being able to handle these genetic, you know, um, word I'm looking for is like a, a reboot and that's kind of what the viruses are supposed to do is genetically offer us a reboot and they're they're typically a way for us to you know broaden our immune system and our response to the environment and fortunately we haven't been able to handle this new genetic makeup and it's from the toxicities that we're surrounded by every day um, if you look really at China for example where this whole thing started well, you have a conundrum of toxicity. It's where almost most of the Roundup is sprayed is in that vicinity of China. You have the most air pollution that comes down into that area. You have the biggest pork manufacturing area where all the antibiotics are given to the animals. So it was a conundrum of different toxicities where this virus was first initiated and the immune system is not able to handle this new setup and now we're consequently we're having a hard time trying to get over this viral update if you will so i do? think folks on, yeah, yeah it, and, and you know focusing on how to rid our bodies of these toxicities i think should be our focus as opposed to you know how do we try to eliminate viruses when it's impossible to do that 
Yeah, they're going to be out there. So we just have to get healthier. And, and you suggest how to do that. Well, you know, so again, you, you look at you look at Roundup and, you know, I know that people think of that as the, the you know, you've heard the, the different lawsuits that have come forth with that. You know, it, it basically, it, it's a pesticide and it's designed to kill weeds so that it helps these genetic modified foods. But unfortunately, what it does is it gets into our system from the foods we eat and it creates havoc on our immune system and our gut health. And I know it's hard to eat, you know, organically all the time. I understand that. I know it's a cost issue, but really trying to avoid, you know, these genetically modified foods and trying to be aware of where these foods are coming from, I think that's paramount. Right. Um, and, you know, the microbiome in our bodies, you know, it's, it's the shifts that we're seeing and because of these genetically modified foods is really starting to show itself in, you know, the cancers that we're seeing now, um, autoimmune conditions, the neurological conditions, all these things are just on the rise. So trying to avoid, number one, these genetically modified foods and trying to figure out a way to, to stop using these chemicals and these herbicides on our foods is, is so important. And that has to come from lobbying and, and changing which is another whole story. Right. That might, that might not be something that we can fix individually right now, but it should be a concern, something we could take to lawmakers and, and get some policy changes on that. As far as our individual health, looking for those uh, foods that are, don't have those toxins in them, what else can we do? Maybe like vitamin D. Yeah, yeah, vitamin D is great. Um, and before I get into like exactly vitamin D, I wanted to kind of talk about a few other toxins that we don't think about. Sure. And the first being, um, you know, even the, the toxins that are in our plastic water bottles. And, you know, everybody's walking around with a plastic water bottle. But those plastic water bottles are releasing chemicals into the water and that we're ingesting. So, you know, being cautious of that, you know, trying to avoid any plastic water bottle and using, you know, charcoal filters at our house, you know, carrying around water bottles, aluminum water bottles ourselves, so staying away from that. I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, even the chemicals that we put on our bodies, especially sunscreen, um, you know, those sunscreen chemicals, they absorb into our skin and those wreak havoc on our bodies as well. They say the average woman every morning before she leaves for work puts on over 140 chemicals on her body from moisturizers to makeup to hairspray to mascara to everything else. So, you know, being aware that these things are getting into your body and affecting your body are really important. Um, you, know, you know, just looking at, you know, correlation between antibiotic use. And I, you know, in preparation for talking to you, I was looking at, you know, as in practice, we do a lot of primary care and, um, I was looking at, you know, I try to be very cautious of how much antibiotics that we prescribe. However, a lot of people that come see us sometimes think we're not doing our job if they don't leave with an antibiotic. But I found this statistic pretty interesting. Just one single course of antibiotics in one year period increased the development of depression in the next 12 months by 17% and anxiety disorder by 25%. If they had two courses of antibiotics within that year, it increased the risk of depression by 44% and the risk of an anxiety disorder by 52%. So even the antibiotics that we think are doing wonderful things for us offer some unfortunate side effects as well. So those are just some examples of some ways to you know, be careful and cautious of the toxicities and the things that we're allowing into our environment, into our bodies. Um, getting back to vitamin D, now we all know that Trump just went to the hospital and Walter Reed and the doctors were saying that, you know, what prescriptions and what medications he was taking and one of those was vitamin D. And they've done all sorts of studies. There was a study out of Iran recently where there was no deaths that they witnessed of COVID with a vitamin D level above 40. 
So there's definitely been a correlation with low vitamin D and COVID deaths. So what does vitamin D do? Vitamin D, you, you know, you really think of it as a vitamin, but it's actually a hormone. Um, and it does a, a multitude of different things. Um, for one thing, in a double-blind randomized controlled study, it decreased the risk of age-related macular degeneration, dementia, um, pulmonary function was improved. Uh, it also decreases the risk of breast cancer. Um, so it's really, really important for our, our immune system. So vitamin D is a very, very important you know, thing that you can do uh, to enhance your immune system, to enhance your mood even. And for women with osteopenia and osteoporosis, it helps enhance bone health. The thing that I see, fortunately, is most people think if they go outside, they have sufficient vitamin D. However, we see patients in our office, golfers with a golf tan where you can see where their socks were, and they have low vitamin D. So you can't just say because you get a decent tan that you'll have good enough levels of vitamin D to be. So you really have to take enough of it in order for it to be effective. And the best thing to know as far as the amount to take would be to talk to a physician and find out um, exactly where, um, you know, what, what the time, uh, what the, the amount should be. So um, we are need to move on to the next one because we're, we're kind of running out on our time here. So do you want to move on to maybe the uh, disease model versus health model really quick? Yeah, I think um, in general, unfortunately, in this country, we're, we're thought to think of the disease model as it is really our standard of care for healthcare. And that is, is we, we try to wait for issues to happen, and then we try to fix them after they happen. Right. And my, my argument is, if medicine is really the answer, and if spending money on healthcare was the answer, we would be the healthiest people on the face of the earth. We spend the most money on healthcare, we take the most medications. Yet, that's not even close to the story. You know, last time I looked, I think we were like 37. You know, we were right just above Costa Rica for, you know, infant mortality and overall life expectancy. So our system's broken. And I think it is because of that. I think we, we tend to focus more on disease and fixing disease than we do on health prevention. Um, I think the better idea is to look at, you know, how do we prevent these problems from occurring? Right. You know, instead of putting all our emphasis on, cancer treatment, you know, we're in Breast Cancer Awareness Month, why are we focusing more of our effort on breast cancer prevention? And there's very little that is ever said about that. Um, I wish the walks were about that, preventing it from happening rather than waiting for it and trying to fix it. Right. And then you think about, well, what are the aspects of health? And we, we sort of talked about one already, it's what you put into your body, you know, and that's nutrition. So, you know, that's really, really important, the foods you eat, and that's what you really emphasize with a lot of our patients is, you know, really trying to make sure that they understand the food they should be eating and the, and the food they should be avoiding, because there's a lot of misconception, right? Um, the other thing, go ahead. Well, we're, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure that I tell folks that to learn more about some of these ways to be um, better, you know, the disease model versus health model and, and what you need to do is, is check out your website. I'll have that information uh, available in the description. And you also make a newsletter available um, where you're actually going to provide a matcha latte recipe, one way to get healthy as well. And so you're going to make those things available on your website and on your Facebook page so people can become more connected to you and what you're doing to uh, address this issue of getting healthier rather than just popping medications. It's, you know, a whole body, uh, you know, perspective on this and outlook. So I want to thank you for your time for this edition of Conversations with Nicole. We will continue this conversation um, in our next episode with you because we have a lot more to come. So thank you for being with me today. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back with more conversations with Nicole the next time I see you. Until then, we hope you have a great day. Thanks so much.